503 here. We've got a good amount of people who have joined us. So I think we're going to get started because um, the first few minutes will just mostly be um, sort of introductory. Um, it'll give people a chance uh, who are joining us a bit late to settle in without missing um, the bulk of the presentation. So um, hello, thank you for joining us. My name is uh, Nick Maturo. Some of you may already know me. Uh, I'm a research coordinator on the Quebec Relations Project at ELAN. Uh, and I've been hosting these uh, monthly webinars since we started doing them uh, oh, back in March now, I think. Or no, it was May, sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it hasn't been that long yet, but we are, we are uh, cruising along and adding to our, our list of webinars that we've had to date. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'll just take care of a bit of housekeeping um, before we dive into uh, the bulk of today's topic. Um, so I do ask that uh, you keep your video and your mic your video off and your microphones muted um, during the session uh, for two reasons. Uh, it will help minimize distractions for your fellow participants. Um, it'll also help uh, save on Zoom bandwidth, um, which is always good because sometimes it can cause um, choppy audio or video when there are too many people on. So we want to minimize that as much as possible for, um, for a good viewing experience for everyone. Um, if for some reason the Zoom session is interrupted, some sort of, you know, technical who knows what, um, I'll send a new link out via um, email as soon as possible afterwards. We'll just pick up where we left off. Um, please do note that this session will be recorded for archival purposes, um, but we will not be sharing any part of the recording that contains the faces, voices, written words, or names of our participants unless we've uh, obtained their written consent. Um, but we will be sharing an edited version of this, uh, this archival recording plus one for all our previous webinars uh, soon enough on the Elan website. So uh, for anyone who misses out or who wants to revisit one of these in full, uh, you'll be able to do so. So before moving on, I want to extend uh, another welcome to members of the Elan team who are helping out today. Uh, first, there's Guy Rogers, who is Exan, or Elan's executive director uh, and the project manager of Quebec Relations. Um, in a few moments, Guy will be telling us a little bit more about the project and providing some background. Um, and I'd also like to welcome Swati Kana, who is our program manager. And Swati has once again uh, graciously offered to help moderate our question and answer period at the end of the session. So without further ado, this is the fourth in a series of webinars that we're offering through the Quebec Relations Project. Um, Simply put, Quebec Relations um, is a project that's all about helping arts and culture organizations access new funding uh, through the provincial government. So since quarantine began, uh, we've really tried to, uh, to offer a lot more contact with the community, a lot more resources to the community, obviously given the circumstances, um, try to stay in touch monthly through these, these webinars. Um, so each month we've been presenting one to two of these sessions on a range of topics that have sort of generally centered around uh, funding for arts and culture organizations. Um, so today we're moving a bit beyond the relatively familiar terrain of uh, arts and culture funding into somewhat uncharted territory. Um, we're gonna be speaking about some of the programs that are offered by Quebec's other ministries uh, and other funding agencies, which aren't directed at our field but which can still be very useful to, uh, to arts and culture organizations. Um, this is a particularly important session for us as uh, one of our goals with this project was really to provide as sort of complete uh, and 360 degree of a survey of available funds as possible uh, and to really look into every program that's out there to get a sense of what is available to help people. Um, so I'm really happy to uh, finally have a chance to uh, share this research with you in detail um, and to help you to start thinking about what kinds of other grants can be useful to your work. So um, with this and with all of our sessions and the work that we do, of course, um, we really do welcome your feedback, um, anything you have to offer, um, suggestions, um, constructive criticism. Uh, we really do wanna be as responsive to the community's needs as possible, uh, provide you appropriate support and provide you um, sort of information and resources like this that are um, interesting and actually useful to you. So please, um, if you have anything that you want to add, just, just let us know. I'm, I'm happy to hear from you. So uh, just a brief outline of how we're going to proceed today. Um, first, I'll have Guy uh, provide a bit of background on Quebec relations. Um, some of you are probably already aware of what we do to some degree, others perhaps not so much. So Guy will make sure that we're all on uh, 
equal footing all on that so we can understand uh, what the project is all about moving forward. Um, and then I'll provide a bit of background on my research, um, how we've tried to present this information uh, on our website, on our searchable funding platform, um, as well as sort of our goals in uh, the kinds of informations we've, information we've wanted to present and how we've wanted to present it. So then on to the main topic for today, which will be actually going through a selection of these programs from different ministries and funding bodies. Um, I've prepared, prepared a bunch of those. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through the program descriptions, uh, tell you about noteworthy eligibility criteria, um, and wherever possible, I'll try to give you some actual uh, potential applications uh, for how these grants can be used for arts and culture. Um, so in particular, we'll be looking at some programs offered by Emploi Québec, uh, several from the Ministry of Tourism, two from the Ministère des Affaires Municipales et de l'Habitation, and uh, concluding with a, a program offered by the Société d'Habitation du Québec. Uh, and then I'll finish with just sort of a brief discussion of how Quebec relations can actually help you apply for some of this funding as well as other grants uh, at the provincial level that you may be interested in pursuing. And uh, lastly, as always, we'll close off with a brief question period. So uh, typically how that works, um, feel free to ask your questions in the chat uh, by typing them out um, sort of throughout the presentation as they come up, or if you prefer, you can, um, you can wait until the end, but basically Swati uh, will uh, be collecting those and sending them over to me and I'll read through them at the end and we'll get through as many as we can of course, anything we don't get to, I'm happy to discuss via email uh, directly with you afterwards. Um, as always, with these webinars, we have a lot to cover. I'm going to try to move through at a, a fairly decent pace, but please let me know in the chat window if it is moving too fast. Um, it's also, you know, admittedly a lot of information, but uh, as I've been doing with these, I will be sharing uh, the presentation slides via email afterwards which will have uh, links, important links to program documentation. You won't have to keep all of this uh, eligib eligibility criteria in your head. It'll be all there for you. Uh, and as I mentioned, we'll also be uploading archival rep recordings onto our website very soon. Um, and I'll let you all know once those are available. So just a final note before we proceed, um, as much as possible, I've really tried to make this selection of programs relevant to your needs uh, based on the information you were kind enough to provide when registering for this webinar. Um, I'll also make sure to highlight programs which are, are of particular note to our colleagues in the regions. Um, there are a few of those which may be beneficial to you. Um, but please do keep in mind, uh, this is sort of a challenging subject matter in that not all of these programs are directly relevant to everyone because sometimes they have sort of a more specific focus. Um, so more than anything, consider this an introduction to learn what um, some of the options are, some of the things you can consider uh, that might be relevant to you. But as always, uh, the best thing to do is really to get in touch with me directly um, so I can help steer you towards anything that is particularly relevant to you and help find you some useful funding. Um, so with that said, I will hand things over to Guy. Thank you, Nick. Uh, hello, folks. It's good to see a mixture of uh, familiar faces and a few uh, people who are new to me, at least. This project was funded by the Secretariat for Relations with English-Speaking Quebecers, which was created about three years ago by the Couillard Liberals. And the director of the Secretariat had a meeting with me and asked if there continues to be a problem for English-speaking artists to receive funding from Quebec. And of course, the answer is yes. Um, sometimes it's because we don't have information. Sometimes the fact that much of it is not available in English is a problem for people. And sometimes there are barriers that are either real or perceived. So with Nick and the funding from the Secretariat, he's gone through as many provincial funding sources as possible starting with the obvious ones like CALC and SODEC, the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Education, but also touching on the funding sources we're going to discuss today. He created one pagers, translated them into English, put them on a web page that is searchable. So if you have not yet looked at that, there's a lot of other information that hasn't been discussed here or won't be discussed here today. During the course of this project, we actually want to assist people to write their grant applications and we want to know what grant applications you write so that we can monitor results to see if there are any sort of systemic problems about accessing funding uh, through the Quebec government. 
calc is fairly well known to most of us, but calc is critically aware that English speaking artists do not feel as comfortable applying to them as they do to Canada Council or the Montreal Arts Council. So they work with Elan on information sessions and outreach, and we are certainly there to help you understand calc. SODEC is known to a lot of you. Some people have very positive experiences with SODEC. Some find it almost impenetrable. Many of you have heard of Emploi Quebec, but beyond that, it's pretty much uncharted territory. You know, I've been running arts organizations for decades. I was on the founding board of CALC many years ago, and many of the things that Nick has found are brand new to me. So I'm sure there'll be a revelation to you today. During the course of this grant, we've had to uh, adjust COVID-19 struck everybody, so Nick has, has aggregated all the available information about uh, support and assistance from all levels of government, and we've shared that. He gave uh, a couple of webinars about presenting art online and monetizing it. We will, we will, con <clears throat> excuse me. We will continue to um, add information, to develop information as it becomes available to suit your needs. You know, it's always difficult to find resources to make art. It's increasingly difficult under pandemic conditions. And the, uh, the austerity period that is bound to follow is going to be tough for all of us. So while we have this source of funding, which frankly we hope will be extended for a few more years, we have the resources to help you. So we really want you to contact us, to call us, to email us, to avail yourselves of the resources. We have this funding for sure until March 31st, so use it. Beyond that, we don't know, but we will be happy to hear from any of you and all of you. So again, thank you for attending today. I'm gonna to hand it over to Nick, and uh, I know he has a lot of really interesting things to say. Thanks. Thanks, Guy. Okay, without further ado, we will uh, we'll get down to business here. So um, I'm just gonna provide, at the beginning, uh, a bit of an overview of the work I've done uh, in my funding research uh, since joining the Quebec Relations Project last summer. So uh, as Guy mentioned, one of the major tasks has been not only trying to find all of the um, provincial funding programs that are available to arts and culture organizations, so both not-for-profits and for-profit companies, um, but also to really effectively document these programs um, and of course all of the relevant eligibility criteria um, so as to make it easier for members of the community to uh, actually identify the funding that makes sense for them. So the end result uh, was this searchable funding platform that we launched in March of this year. Um, you can see a link to it in the slides, which I'll be sending out via email. Um, so this includes summaries and uh, program documentation for over 130 different programs, all translated into English. Uh, much of those programs, this is the only place you'll be able to find that documentation in English. Um, but because we really wanted to go beyond what we already knew was out there, um, this involved really combing through the websites of each provincial ministry, uh, a variety of other secretariats, agencies, uh, provincial crown corporations, uh, to look at the programs they're offering and try to collect everyone that could be of use to an arts and culture organization. Um, and when I speak of usefulness here, I, I really do mean in the broadest sense possible. So every program that didn't have just sort of a, a hyper-specific sort of sectoral focus uh, and which could potentially apply to an arts and culture organization uh, was fair game, and I tried to collect as many of those as possible. Um, of course, the issue here is that a program that may seem uh, totally irrelevant to one organization uh, could very well be a sort of funding missing link to another organization that has, uh, has work that applies to that, that particular program. Uh, so that's why it's important, I think, to keep an open mind uh, and also to uh, investigate all, all the available options uh, fairly thoroughly. So the end result of uh, my work on the subject was uh, a collection of 18 non-arts and culture programs that have been included in our funding platform. I will note here that admittedly some of this documentation does need to be updated uh, due to very recent changes because of COVID-19. Um, some programs have been slightly modified. Uh, and there are also a couple of new programs that will need to be investigated further moving forward. Um, but those are on my radar. I will get those on the funding platform ASAP, and otherwise what is on there now can give you a, a fairly good and accurate idea of what is available to you. Of course, um, it's important to do more than just share the information with members of the community. As we know from the focus groups and surveys that we uh, conducted last year, just providing somebody with you know dozens and dozens of pages of information 
uh, doesn't necessarily actually make it easier to apply. Um, it's really crucial to help guide people through the application process um, and encourage and support uh, your applications and you know, make it seem like it's worth your while to try something new and something that is in a lot of cases uh, relatively untested. Uh, this is important for several reasons. Uh, first, obviously, it has the potential to bring in uh, important new sources of funding into the English-speaking arts and culture community um, and uh, provide important resources for your own work. Um, and secondly, it also provides us with important data on a variety of funding programs that are not usually on our radar. So in a sense, uh, while we of course only want you to spend your time applying for programs that are worth the effort regarding your chances of, uh, chances of success, any applications you do make to these non-arts funders uh, can really serve as vital test cases uh, for the whole community going forward. It'll allow us to get a better idea of these funders' openness to arts and culture um, as a sector, uh, not just based on sort of the success of your application, but really the, you know, the entirety of your experience, uh, what your interactions with the funder was, was like. And we can of course use that data to guide other applicants more effectively in the future uh, and hopefully help more people apply. So with that in mind, uh, let's actually take a look at some of the funding opportunities that are out there that I have selected for today. So we'll begin by talking about Emploi Québec. Um, Emploi Québec is probably the most uh, generally relevant funder that we'll be discussing today. Um, and they, it can really be helpful in addressing a fairly common need. Um, so based on feedback everyone uh, provided when registering today, but also in our webinars and in our surveys, or pardon me, in our, our focus groups and our surveys, uh, one thing that comes up time and time again is just the need for additional capacity and uh, for more people to help with the important work that you're doing. Obviously, some arts and culture funding will allow you to cover uh, the wages of, of people working with you, uh, whether that's project or operating funding. Um, but Emploi Quebec uh, can be a really fantastic resource to either supplement that or um, to be used instead. Uh, making use of Emploi Quebec funding uh, is not without its challenges. Uh, I know I've spoken with uh, some colleagues in the community who have found aspects of the process uh, somewhat complicated and confusing at times. Um, so if you are thinking of applying uh, and in need, of, in need of some guidance, I'm certainly available to help answer any questions you may have about the application process. Um, and it is also worth noting that it can be a double-edged sword uh, in the sense that hiring somebody uh, generates new capacity for your organization, uh, but it also does necessitate time and effort on your part in order to uh, train them uh, and integrate them into your, your organization. Um, and sort of that obviously requires time and energy on your part um, that you may or may not have available. So you have to sort of make that calculation of whether it's worth pursuing or not. But I do think if, if you ask most app, uh, organizations who've made use of Emploi Quebec funding, uh, they would tell you that that support has allowed them to bring really talented people into their uh, team and it's allowed them to do really important work. I know even at Alain, we've had uh, great experiences hiring temporary staff to help with things like communications and social media, uh, which we all know are, are super important and really require special attention. Uh, and it's hard to take you know, time out of your own busy schedule uh, to devote to that and really to do it properly. Uh, so please note that for all the Emploi Quebec programs I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, you will need to apply through your local employment center. Uh, you can reach by phone or by email. Uh, and I've included a link in the slides uh, to the webpage where you can enter your postal code to, um, to find the one closest to you. So first is this program wage subsidies for employees. Um, so if you're looking to fill a position on a temporary basis, uh, this is really the first program uh, that you should be looking at. Uh, you can apply at any time. There's no set deadline for this or any other Emploi Quebec program. Uh, it's open to not-for-profits, for-profit companies, as well as cooperatives. Um, it can cover a regular full-time position for up to 30 weeks. Um, in some exceptional cases, that can go up to 52 weeks. Um, and it also covers seasonal employment. Uh, but I think it's uh, worth clarifying here that the definitions of seasonal employment on their, in their documentation are quite specific. Um, doesn't really apply to sort of seasonal arts and culture work. It's really sort of uh, more reserved for agriculture, uh, fishing, uh, things of that nature. Um, so the amount of a uh, person's wages uh, it, 
are not covered in full, but can be covered uh, in quite a large part. Um, so the actual amount does vary according to a number of factors, such as the nature of their position with your organization, um, any integration difficulties that employee may have, and of course, any additional support that you need to uh, provide them. The next program is called uh, Job Stabilization. Um, this is support that allows organizations to prolong the working periods for staff on precarious uh, or seasonal contracts. Uh, it's available to not-for-profit organizations and for-profit companies, but also a range of other potential applicants uh, that can include self-employed workers uh, and professional associations amongst others. Some important criteria to note, however, before uh, proceeding with an application, um, organizations must be considered to be established and demonstrate good prospects for growth. Uh, stabilization projects must be recurring and continue after the implemented, uh, implementation period uh, covered by the Emploi Quebec support. And stabilization projects must aim to prolong employment periods uh, through uh, measures such as diversifying an organization's products or services, um, developing new activities related to its principal business, uh, or any other means uh, leading to greater employment stability. So really, it's not just about providing uh, some extra money for a single precarious position. It's trying to address that precari precarity head on. Um, in terms of eligible costs, it can cover up to 50% of an employee's salary um, to a maximum of $5,000 per job. Uh, it can also cover consulting fees for certain projects if Emploi Quebec deems them to be uh, complex enough to uh, necessitate those, uh, that additional funding. Um, but Emploi Quebec really does offer more than just uh, support for sort of employment and specific positions. Uh, they also offer some advisory services for training and human resources, which I think are very interesting and useful. So first among those is a program called uh, Support for Human Resources Management. Uh, this program offers a number of useful services, uh, including uh, establishing a profile of your company to help get a sense of your organization's needs, uh, provides management support and coaching, uh, can help you establish a consultation committee, and of course, just general support for human resources management, uh, as the program title indicates. It can cover up to 50% of costs related with this kind of uh, HR program, uh, and support through this program can also help cover the cost of consultant fees and one-time training costs for staff. The next program I think is even more uh, interesting and potentially useful. Uh, it's called the Workforce Training Measure, Mesure de, la, de Formation de la Main d'Oeuvre. Uh, this program is intended for staff who are at risk of losing their job uh, to help them develop their skills, uh, but it's also to upgrade the overall skills and expertise of an organization. Um, so it includes services such as defining your training needs, carrying out a training project, and then uh, evaluating the efficiency and success of that project afterwards. So applicant organizations uh, will need to demonstrate that their training activity uh, does the following. It will need to keep people in employment, uh, will need to improve the performance of their employees, and it needs to be transferable to other staff members. And you can uh, apply for actually a variety of, of really interesting activities. So improving an employee's French language skills, uh, as well as other language skills, uh, literacy, generic skills training, uh, professional and technical training, so a sort of more specialized focus, management training, and also uh, training for new technology or equipment, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, so the program can cover up to 50% of the costs associated with uh, such a training program. So these Emploi Quebec programs should give you a pretty good idea of the kind of human resources support that is available to your organization if you, if you wish to pursue it. Um, obviously the wage subsidies are probably the most uh, enticing for, for most organizations um, and have the sort of most immediate impact. Uh, but I do encourage you to check out these other programs that I mentioned if you are interested. Um, I think they offer you a lot of flexibility in terms of the kind of HR work that you uh, really just might not otherwise have the resources to carry out. So next, we're going to move on to a range of really interesting uh, programs that are available through the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, the Ministry of Tourism is of particular interest to us, I would say, uh, based on the, the really sort of seemingly obvious synergy 
uh, between arts and culture in Quebec and our provincial tourism industry. But at the same time, uh, the ministry's programs really do represent uh, a sort of an unknown quantity and I think uh, quite a lot of untapped potential uh, that we want to encourage organizations to investigate further where it makes sense. So I put together some inf information on, I would say, the most relevant uh, Ministry of Tourism programs that I came across. Uh, beginning with this program called Programme d'accessibilité des établissements touristiques, a uh, program for the accessibility of tourist establishments. So this is a, one of the more specific and useful Ministry of Tourism programs I think I've found. Um, so the program uh, really supports accessibility in Quebec tourist establishments for persons with a disability. Um, it's offered in partnership with another organization called Kerul, which supports the accessibility of tourism and cultural venues. Um, and it can provide financial support to projects that help tourist sites uh, obtain a Kerul accessibility rating um, or projects that help to improve uh, existing accessibility infrastructures. It can cover up to 80% of your project uh, to a maximum of $50,000. You can apply as a not-for-profit organization, a for-profit company, or a cooperative. Um, and this program runs until March 2022. So it's, it's around for a little while. Um, and I think if you run a venue or a kind of cultural space that has a tourism component, that you can make that case for it having a sort of a, a tourism impact, this could be a really great way to help make your space more accessible, uh, which we all know is, 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 is super important. Um, and, it, and you can do so without necessarily uh, requiring a huge uh, investment of your own resources. The next program is called the Entente Partenariat Régional en Tourisme, Regional Tourism Partnership Agreement. Um, so this is a program that is really geared towards organizations with a, uh, with a tourism offer across all the regions of Quebec, um, administrated, uh, administered in collaboration with the various regional tourism associations. Um, and while organizations in the metropolitan region can apply, I think it does hold particular uh, interest and value for organizations in the regions. Um, one thing to note though, projects must be uh, sort of quote unquote structuring in nature. Uh, so basically they have to offer some sort of uh, applicability and usefulness beyond just your own work. Uh, and they really have to sort of uh, enrich the tourism offer of the region that you're based in. Uh, projects also need to meet the following objectives. So first they need to stimulate the region's economy. And second, they need to encourage the development of a regional tourism offering that is both original, but is also respectful of sustainable development practices. So this program in its current form is a bit different from the, uh, the documentation on our platform, although I will be working to, uh, to get that updated as soon as possible, uh, just because they've had some sort of uh, recent adjustments taking into account COVID-19. So based on that, uh, now eligible projects can fall into sort of three main sections of the program. Uh, the first supports small and medium-sized tourism organizations uh, for opening in the 2020 season. Uh, and it's for projects that help their facilities meet the province's COVID-19 sanitation guidelines for both customers and staff. So that's obviously extremely timely and important. Uh, the second program section is very similar to the first, uh, but is basically just intended for joint projects between multiple small and medium organizations uh, responding to those same COVID-19 guidelines. The third, third section is a little bit more general uh, and can accommodate a variety of projects. Uh, including uh, sort of strengthening, install, installing or expanding uh, tourism attractions or facilities, feasibility studies that are conducted uh, in order to develop the tourism offering and to determine the financial viability of a project, the development of the regional tourism offer. Uh, so it can be things such as, uh, they give the example of sightseeing tours, uh, tourist roads, um, but it can just sort of be in general, the development of a kind of themed tourism product can also uh, support accommodations serving a particular region, uh, a festival or tourist event, or consulting services. services. So the program, uh, it's quite broad. Um, and in terms of its actual uh, details, so things like deadlines, minimum project costs, grant amounts, uh, and eligible amounts, um, these do vary according to the region. So the best thing to do is to get in touch if you're interested with your local uh, regional tourism association or perhaps indeed with the, the Ministry of Tourism itself. Um, but particularly these regional tourism associations 
uh, we'll be able to provide you with uh, the necessary details as well as an actual application uh, to be able to apply. So the next program that we have is called the Entente de Développement Numérique des Entreprises Touristiques, so Digital Development Agreement for Tourism Businesses. Uh, and this program is uh, also administered together with the regional tourism associations um, and is useful in that it uh, supports the development of tourism organizations in several respects. So first, by encouraging and accelerating the development of digital skills, which we all know are uh, particularly crucial at this juncture, um, and by aiding the digital, sort of, quote unquote, digital transformation of these organizations, so helping them get brought up to speed with the latest technologies. And lastly, by helping these organizations create innovative content uh, that enhances the tourism experience. So it's open to small and medium-sized businesses, whether for-profit or not-for-profit, as well as cooperatives. Um, applicants must either be a tourist attraction or a tourist accommodation establishment. So you would simply have to sort of uh, make that case for your own organization. Um, it can cover up to 50% of the cost of your proposed digital development program. Um, and inter interestingly enough, uh, eligible expenses covered by this program uh, go beyond just training and development costs, but they can also uh, cover the costs related to technological equipment and software, uh, which is, is extremely useful. So that brings us to the end of uh, the Ministry of Tourism programs that I wanted to highlight. Um, I do wanna suggest that across the board, if you're interested in any of these programs, the best thing to do is, is really to get in touch uh, with a representative of your, uh, your region's uh, tourism association, really to determine whether your work applies, uh, whether it meets the criteria of sort of a tourist uh, attraction or tourist offering. Um, and each association obviously has slightly variable criteria. The scale of the organizations that they're looking to support may differ, but of course it, it really doesn't hurt to get in touch uh, and try to find out for sure. And of course, for all of these programs, uh, I've listed contact information on the funding platform. So next, we're going to move on to looking at the Ministère des Affaires Municipales et Habitation. So it has two interesting programs, uh, one which is directed at the regions and one which is specifically for Montreal. Um, and I would say even more so than the Ministry of Tourism, these represent uh, an untapped and relatively untested resource for the arts and culture community. So both these programs uh, target projects which uh, have an impact across a given region. And so are maybe more uh, kind of high level or structuring type projects uh, compared to sort of small and, and directed projects for your own organization. So the first program is called the Fonds Région et Ruralité, uh, Regional and Rural Funds. So this is a new program that was launched in April of this year. Um, and sort of takes the place of several of the ministry's uh, previous existing regional programs. Um, so on that note, please, please uh, be aware that it's not on our funding platform as of yet, but I will be adding it as soon as possible. Um, for our purposes for arts and culture, it's really the first section of the program that is the most relevant to us. Um, it specifically replaces a program which was on our platform called the Fonds d'appui au rayonnement des régions. Um, so the new uh, section one of this program is called Soutien au rayonnement des régions, uh, and it supports projects that promote regional vibrancy across multiple regional county municipalities. So these really have to be projects that have an, intra, uh, an impact on more than one uh, regional county municipality and contribute to the appeal of that region in general. Uh, it's open to all regions except for Montreal and the Capitale Nationale. Um, and all organizations are eligible with the exception of private companies and cooperatives which operate in the finance sector. Um, funding available uh, can be quite significant. It goes up to uh, $1 million annually per project to a maximum total of 3 million over five years. Um, and it can cover between 50 to 80% of project costs depending on your organization profile and your region. So potentially for, for high level projects, it can, it can be quite a significant source of funding. Um, eligible expenses include all direct project costs, uh, relevant construction costs, and expenses that are related to uh, carrying out studies and developing project plans. Um, selection committees will judge projects based on, amongst other criteria, the scope of their impact within a region uh, and the economic benefits, so including job creation most notably. 
This program, uh, as I mentioned, certainly does emphasize large projects, but depending on the impact of your work within your region, uh, it may be a good idea to speak with somebody at the ministry uh, to discuss your proposed project and really just to determine if it might be a good fit. Um, one thing you do need to keep in mind is that eligible projects uh, must be in line with a particular region's uh, priorities, uh, which are listed on the ministry's website. Uh, you can see the underlined text in the slide saying regional priorities. When I send out the slides, you can click that and find out exactly what those are. Um, and also, if you're looking for more information on this program, uh, as I mentioned, I will be updating our funding platform soon. But in the meantime, um, you can follow the link in the slides to view the documentation in French on the ministry's website. So the next program is called the Fonds d'Initiative uh, et de Rayonnement de la Métropole, uh, Metropolitan Initiative and Outreach Fund. So the ministry offers this project, uh, program, which is specifically aimed at the metropolitan region, i.e. Montreal. Um, the program does seemingly target fairly high level projects, once again, like that previous program. But I do think it's worth highlighting because it, it is one of the few uh, programs we've looked at today that does explicitly fund cultural projects and events and, and sort of says as much in its documentation. It's open to not-for-profit organizations, cooperatives, uh, and for-profit companies. And uh, sort of project proposals can fall under two main program sections. The first is support for major projects and events that have both an economic and cultural impact in Montreal. So for uh, the ministry, uh, they describe uh, a major event as having a budget of more than $1 million and 25,000 uh, total attendees. So quite significant. Um, but you can also apply under the second section of the program, which is support for projects responding to a particular regional issue. So a bit more general and uh, perhaps a bit more approachable. Total funding can go up to $500,000 per project, uh, which can represent uh, up to 50% of project costs for a not-for-profit organization uh, or 20% for a for-profit company. Um, and as you can see in the slides, the deadlines for these two programs uh, are coming up in November and September, respectively. Um, those are just sort of the, uh, the first uh, set of deadlines for projects which would start at the beginning of next year. There are also some, some later deadlines, which you can keep in mind if you uh, are proposing a project which starts a little bit later in 2021. Um, so as I mentioned, the eligibility criteria for the major projects component uh, are quite demanding, uh, but it can still be really useful for things like festivals and other events that have a wider impact in Montreal. Um, and when it comes to accessing support for projects uh, responding to a regional issue, you do have more flexibility in what you can propose. So lastly, I want to con conclude this section uh, with uh, a useful program from the Société d'Habitation du Québec, uh, which is also really good for accessible spaces. Um, it's called the Petit Établissement Accessible, Accessibility for Small Establishments. Um, so it's similar to the Ministry of Tourism's accessibility program, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and this program really helps small establishments improve their accessibility for disabled people and persons with limited mobility. Um, the program is divided into three main sections. So first, it offers uh, improvement, uh, improved access to the establishment. So things such as adding an access ramp um, or revert, reserved parking spaces for persons with limited mobility. Uh, second, it can offer a barrier-free route inside the establishment for access to services and restrooms. So that will help you do things like standardize floor levels, widen doors, uh, and add automatic doors. And lastly, uh, it helps uh, to improve the use of restrooms which are reserved for customers or attendees. Um, so it can provide more space in those, uh, install uh, grab bars or handrails, and also uh, lower light switches amongst other things. So it's, in terms of who it's open to, it's, it's very general uh, in the sense that any physical or legal person who owns or rents all or part of a building um, which is used for commercial business or meeting purposes can apply. Um, there are some more sort of strict uh, eligibility criteria when it comes to the establishment itself. So eligibility, eligible buildings can include, include uh, places of buildings, pardon me, <laughs> places of business offering a service on site and located uh, in a building of no more than two stories. Um, commercial establishments having a total surface area of at most 300 square meters. 
Um, meeting establishments that hold at most nine people, so fairly small, um, as well as other establishments uh, which are eligible if they meet uh, sort of more general criteria, um, which were too lengthy to list in full on the slides, but you can view those um, in the link provided to our funding platform. Um, so this program covers 75% uh, of eligible costs up to $15,000, uh, which can include construction costs, professional fees, and uh, also the cost of obtaining a permit. So another a potentially very useful program if you run uh, a venue or a cultural space of specific size. So that brings us to the end of the programs that I wanted to cover. Um, so based on that admittedly brief survey, you now have a better idea of the kinds of programs that are actually out there. Um, some of you may be thinking, oh, great, now I've got some new options. How exactly do I get started? Um, whereas on the other hand, I'm sure some among you are still a little unsure of whether any of these programs um, actually fit your needs. So I do want to emphasize that this webinar is really just the beginning of the process. Um, the next step is providing individual support to help you move forward. Uh, and we can provide that in a couple of ways. So first, in terms of individual consultations. Uh, one thing our surveys show is that regardless of people's experience level, um, just being able to do the research is an issue in and of itself. Um, could be due to lack of experience, not knowing where to start, finding it a little bit intimidating, uh, which is certainly understandable. And uh, in fact, all the more so uh, when you're you know, dealing with programs that are outside of all of our comfort area. You know, it's not, we're not looking at Calc, Sodec, or Ministry of Culture. A lot of these are, are fairly new and untested. Um, but it can also really just be an issue even for people who have uh, quite a lot of experience and a higher comfort level just because they don't really have the time to devote to it. So uh, if you're not sure about any of the programs I spoke about today or you have some particular funding needs in mind and you think there's got to be something out there for me, um, the best thing to do is really to get in touch directly to schedule an individual funding consultation with me so I can try to steer you towards the most useful options for you. So how that works, typically we'll set up a Zoom or a phone call. I can learn a bit more about your organization, any funding you're already receiving, uh, as well as any particular funding needs that you have uh, moving forward. It may well be that a specific aspect of your work that you describe uh, res resonates with one of the programs that I've come across, um, which might not seem obvious at first glance. So it's important that we have that conversation uh, just to know, you know, are, is any of the, the programs that I've found actually useful to you? So uh, once we've discussed uh, your options, I'll get back to you with a list of relevant programs after doing some research, uh, which we can then discuss and refine based on your feedback. Uh, it's really a, a collaborative process of trying to help you zero in on the, the most useful programs for you. Um, so the second half of what we can do for you, um, let's say you are either already excited about one of the programs we talked about today, um, or we've had an individual, individual consultation in the future, um, and you feel like you've got some solid funding options you want to pursue. Uh, how exactly do you proceed? Uh, obviously, just knowing what the grant is, is not enough. Um, you have to actually apply. And, you know, this can be daunting whether you're a first-time applicant and you're not sure how to begin, or if you're more experienced um, and you're sort of lacking in time, or maybe you're a little bit less familiar with the, the criteria of one of these programs. Um, so we can provide you with subsidized grant writing support, uh, as well as editing and sort of review uh, for people who are more experienced and just want sort of a, a second set of eyes at the end of the process. Um, so this subsidized support is really all the more beneficial when you're approaching these relatively untested programs. Uh, and maybe the idea of undertaking a new ac application feels a little bit more daunting than it would otherwise. Um, we really do want to help you apply and try something new um, because it could be an important funding opportunity not just for you, but for the community in general. If we find out that a program is, you know, very open to working with arts and culture organizations, um, you know, that, that's, that's great news for all of us moving forward. Um, so whether you decide you need some help after an individual consultation, or maybe you know right now that you'd like to get started on an application, all you have to do is reach out. Um, you can contact me via email. My email is gonna be up on the screen at the end of the presentation or you can reply to the uh, message that included your Zoom link for today. Um, should go right to my inbox and we can, we can get started. So uh, with that said, uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation that I had prepared. 
Um, we do have a decent amount of time left for questions. I see a couple came in during the, during the presentation, so I'll start with those. But if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, or if there's not a, a deluge of, <laughs> of questions right away, you can also go ahead and just unmute and, uh, and we'll take it from there.